Well, today, as I've already alluded to, and of course you know by now, is the last day of, uh, today is the last day of 2017. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, somebody posted uh, on their Facebook page, some of our church family posted that, that the, the, uh, the trips around the sun seem to be coming more often. And uh, as they got, get older, and truly they do, they do. I, I heard that all of my life. And, you know, being uh, when I was younger, I didn't, you know, when you're younger, you know a whole lot more than you actually know sometimes. Uh, but I, I used to hear people say that so often that, that uh, as you get older, time goes by so much faster. But you know what? It truly does. And I think the busier that we get in our lives, the busier that our, and the, the, all of the hectic situations and circumstances of our life that we find ourselves uh, so caught up in doing and going constantly that, that it seems like time in itself speeds up, when in reality it doesn't. We know that. But truly, the, the trips around the sun do seem to, to come more often. But my response to that individual was, you know, uh, yes, the trips around the sun come more often, but not only is the earth rotating around the sun, but the earth itself is rotating. And with every rotation of the earth is the completion of another day. And, and, and more so than focusing on the trips of the earth in the orbit around the sun, if we somehow could focus more so on the orbits of the earth, the earthly orbit, the rotation of the earth, and realize truth of the matter is today is the only day that we have. Today is the only day we have, and if we will take today, whatever today is, and we will make the best of it, then when it comes down to the, the day that we've completed another trip around the sun, you know what? We can look back and we can say, I have made the best of this entire year. And I hope that has occurred in your life this year. I hope that, 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 that your life this year has been blessed and it's been tremendous. And, and I know it's not probably not been without hump or bump or uh, a chug hole along the way every once in a while. But I hope this has been a fruitful year for you. But even more so than that, you know, and, I, and we're going to, I'm going to speak to this this morning in my message. You know, 2017 is drawing nearly to a close. Just a few more hours, you know, just a little bit over 12 hours, just a few, 12 hours and a few minutes, and this year will be history. It'll be in the books, and, and tomorrow you'll listen into the radio or watch the TV, and it'll be all of the things that happened in 2017. It's past and it's gone. But I'm believing with you, and I'm trusting with you, that 2018 is going to be the absolute greatest year that you've ever had in your life, because I trust that you are going to give yourself over to the presence of God in 2018 in a manner that you've never done that before. And if you will do that, and if I will do that, we will see great, great things happen in 2018, should the Lord tarry his coming. I'm going to ask uh, the media guys to go ahead and bring up my slideshow, my, my PowerPoint. This morning I want to preach to you with a thought in mind only if my father is holding the rope. Only if my father is holding the rope. You know, I was thinking even as we stood here this morning and pray, prayed for one another, I was thinking, you know, we are, different ones of us in this room have a different opinion of our earthly fathers. There's some in this room that your, your relationship with your dad wasn't the greatest in the world. There's some of you maybe in this room that had no relationship with your earthly father. Then there may be some that, you know, your, your, your dad was your very best friend and is still your very best friend if he's still alive and doing well. So our, our relationship with our fathers is varied, but it's, it's proven in, in um, it's been proven in studies that oftentimes you and I equate our relationship with our heavenly father with that of our earthly father. We equate what God is like to what our earthly dads are like, oftentimes. 
And sometimes that may be good. But if your relationship, if, you, if your dad was, for example, if your, if your father was a, was a very hard person, a, a, a person that was very rigid and very disciplined on you, or, or maybe, or maybe your, your dad was someone that, that didn't give very much attention to his family or something like that, or maybe was neglectful towards his family and his relationship with you as his child, then, then if, you're, if we're not guarded, what can happen is a lot of times those, those, um, those ideals and thoughts that have developed in our mind can spill over into our spiritual walk and, and we can even see God as being a very hard and harsh father at times. But I want you to know that today, that, that as I preach this message, even if your dad, in, in, in your natural life, even if your dad or maybe your mother failed you, even if they failed you, guard your heart that you don't compare God to, to the failures of, of what an earthly dad or an earthly mom may have held in your life. Because the Bible says that there's one that sticks closer than a brother and he is our heavenly father, but, but he is our Lord. He is our God. He is our Christ. He is our Savior. And, and, and God, you know, the, the song, and again, I, I've said this so many times, I'll tell you I'm that smart, but I'm not really that smart. And, uh, uh, but, but the last song that, that Chase led us in there, he is faithful. Understand this, that your heavenly father is faithful. My heavenly father is faithful. Actually, because hopefully they're one in the same. And God is faithful to us with a love that is infallible. It's without error. It's, it's above reproach. There is, there is nothing that can fail in, in or about God. Now, our earthly fathers can fail, and they do fail. I have failed as a father in certain aspects. My dad failed as a father. In certain aspects, my granddads failed as, as fathers in, in certain aspects. But there is a father that is well beyond the comprehension of our minds, and, and he is our loving daddy. And hereby the scripture declares that we can, de we can cry out, Abba Father, or Daddy Jesus, if you would. And he comes and he ministers to us. So this morning, I want to preach to you this message with a thought in mind. Only if my father is holding the rope. I want you to go to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua chapter 1. I, I try, I, I know there's, there's great value in repetition and, and reiteration. Sometimes I, I, do, I do try to avoid things, but I, I went, as I go back to this scripture this morning for this morning's message, as I went back to it, I thought about this is, I think, the first or it's one of the very first scripture texts that I used when I came as pastor of Voice of Praise Worship Center. But I can promise you it's going to be preached in a little bit different context than it was that first service. And, and, I, and, and it's the story of, of a transition. It's not just a story in the sense that sometimes when we say story, we think that it's just some hypothetical illustration. It's the account of a transition. God had led the Israelites that had been in, in over the flesh pots of Egypt for, for, for generation after generation after generation. He now, he's then led them into the wilderness and, and they've been in the wilderness for a gener, for a generation. And now he's getting ready to transition his people again. And as we read the first chapter of the book of Joshua, the word of God says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. And that's so important. Moses, the servant of the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all the people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. And I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. And your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the high tight country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. 
No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Again, God says to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right nor to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous the third time. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want to preach to you this morning with that thought in mind, only if my father is holding the rope. I want us to begin to think about Moses as we examine this transition in the lives of a nation. The lives of the church, the life of the church, if you would, as the Israelites are symbolic of who we are as the church, as God's people. Moses, Moses, the man, the legend. Moses, we know the story of Moses, hopefully most of us do, and, but if you don't, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background. Moses was the servant of the Lord that God chose to lead his people out of generations of that bondage that I spoke of earlier in Egypt. Moses was that guy that, that, that when God called him, Moses was the guy that says, I can't do this, God, because I have a speech problem. I have a speech impediment. And, and I struggle with, with being able to talk and to communicate and, and, and understand that, that God says, no, nah, I'm not letting you off the hook that easy, Moses. He said, I don't give you somebody to be the spokesperson for me. I'm going to give you Aaron. And as I give you Aaron, Aaron will, Aaron will speak, but yet Moses will lead. And Moses led those children out of Egypt's bondage. He led that nation of Israel, that church. And, and out of, they, they left behind generations and they went into the, to the, the desert place and it should have been just a short journey to, to get to their destination of the Canaan land, which is the promise of God. But we know the story, of, at least most of us do, I think, that, that the Israelites got hard-headed and um, uh, even under the leadership of Moses and for 40 years, which is uh, in, in practical mathematics is a generation and for 40 years or a generation the people of Israel or the church walked around in basically in circles. Now in that time we saw great things happen how God gave them manna from heaven and he gave them quail to eat and and he gave them water out of a rock and God did great things in those 40 years in that generation but that wasn't the place that God was choosing to leave them. That was, God didn't choose to leave them forever in Egypt. And God didn't choose to leave them forever in, in the wilderness. It was God, because God had a plan and God had a, a gra far greater destination for Israel. But Moses was the man. Moses was the legend. And still yet today, Moses, in, in the life, of, uh, in, in the life of, of Judaism, Moses is still highly regarded. And in Christianity, Moses is highly regarded. He was the one to give instruction. He was the one that heard the complaints. He was the glue that held it all together while a generation wandered about in the wilderness. That's who Moses was. He was, he was and he still is a legend. And he's not forgotten by any means. But the day came when Moses would die. Moses died a physical death. But I think as I read this scripture and I, I, I saw it, I guess, with a different eye than I've ever seen it with before, when, when God said to Joshua, Moses is dead, it wasn't just the fact that Moses physically had expired, that he physically had passed away, as we say in this day and time. It wasn't just the fact of that, but it is the, 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 the era of Moses' leadership. 
had come to its fruition. And the era of Moses' leadership, as much as we learn from it still today, had come to an end. Moses was dead. And as Moses was dead, his legend lived on, but a new day had arose. A new dispensation, a new time, if you would. Then we see the problem that Joshua had as he began to follow the direction of God. And it take this generation that, that you see, the, the generations of Egypt, the generations that come out of Egypt had now, all of them had physically died except for just this handful, Joshua and his handful of leaders. But what happened in that 40 years of being in the wilderness, pretty, pretty easy to figure out. The people that had come out of Egypt had died. All of those generations, and it was probably multiple generations, probably at least two to three generations of people that have been, that had been birthed in Egypt and grown up in Egypt. Now they all are dead just for a, a few handful. One handful. And, but what happened in that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, there was sons and daughters birthed into the lives of the Israelites. So a new generation had occurred in the wilderness that I referred to this morning as the wilderness generation. The desert babies, if you would, were born. And some of the ones that were born early in the wilderness, they never knew Egypt. The only thing they knew of Egypt is what they heard. They never really lived there, but they heard a lot about it. And, and now some, we've got some that are for up to 40 years old that have grown up desert babies. They lived in the desert. That is the only life they had ever known. You know, as I've been on missions trips, and those of you, uh, of you in the room or maybe watching that have been on trips yourself, ha have you ever noticed that you can go into countries where people have absolutely nothing? You can go into places where, where people, uh, they, 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 they live, they live with less than what we consider the basics, but they seem so happy. Have you ever noticed that? But, but the reality of it is, they don't know any different. When my son got ready to start uh, public school and uh, we took him to the doctor to get his physical and uh, back in that day, which has not been too awful many years ago, he's 32 years old, they had the machine that you actually looked in to check your eyes, sort of like they had at the uh, uh, DMV places. And, and as, as he looked into that machine, and I recall because I was sitting there, the nurse that was doing uh, the preliminaries of his physical, she said, all right, tell me what, you know, tell me what direction the arrows are or something like that. And, uh, and he does it. And then she said, all right, let me, I don't switch eyes. And she flipped that machine and she says, tell me what you can see now. He said, I don't see nothing. It's all black. And she said, are you sure? Yes, ma'am. I can't see anything. Five years old, maybe even four, I don't recall, but he was very young. So, so she said, well, let me look at the machine. She said, oh, no, it's working. She said, look at it again. And she flips the machine. He said, and he's telling her what he sees with one eye. She flips it the other way. He said, no, ma'am, I can't see anything. And, and for, for these whatever five years of his life, we had no idea that he was legally blind in one eye. And I said, why didn't you ever say anything about it? You know, he's talking to you. Why didn't you ever say anything about being blind in one eye? He said, because I never knew it. Because it's always been that way. Okay? Now, thank God through some great, great, a great team of, of optometrists and opticians and so forth and so on, they were able to regain some of his eyesight and actually uh, with, with lenses, you know, God, God, actually, God actually did the work. As he stood in, a, as he stood in a, the courthouse, his mom took him to pay taxes one, Sunday, or one, one day and, and as she walked into the courthouse and he had his eye all patched up and, and, and 
And a friend of ours, which I actually worked under several years, he was the lead pastor and I was his associate. We, she walked in that courthouse with, with our son and he's all patched up. And, and, and Pastor Don, which is also bivocational, he's also a deputy sheriff, is standing in the courthouse lobby and he says, what's wrong with your eyes, Zachary? And he gets the story from his mother and he said, well, we're just going to pray for you right now. And Don in full uniform with the, all of his handcuffs and everything else he, they carried back in that day. He never did carry a nine. He always carried a 38. He was classical, Johnny. With everything strapped on him, he lays both hands on Zach's head and begins to pray in the Holy Ghost right in the middle of the courthouse lobby. And the next time we take him to the doctor, then they begin to tell us, they begin to tell us he begins to see shadows and he begins to see movement. And now with corrective lenses, he has 20, 30 vision in his blind eye. Okay? See, God's good. And God works. But, but he didn't realize what was happening. And we, have a gener we had a generation of people that grew up in the wilderness that didn't know anything any different. But now God is saying, Joshua, you, you're, it's time for you to take these people out of this wilderness and take them into a new place, a new season, and a new time. And by new, that means that everything, by and large, is going to be different than it has been. In fact, we could use the terminology foreign. Because God's saying, Joshua, you're going to take them into a foreign land. You know, we caught, we, uh, while we was in Honduras a few months ago, we, we met up with this guy and he was from, uh, he was from, uh, I don't remember what country. You remember the guy that did the, sh the shooting thing? You know, you remember that, Kerry? We met him in, at the hotel in Honduras and he built, built the, uh, um, the gun range. He was a builder of gun ranges and he was from another country on down in South America. And he gets talking to us. He said, where are you guys from? I said, I'm, we're from America. He said, so am I. He said, I'm from South America. He said, where are you from? <laughs> and because we tend to call ourselves Americans. But, but we, when I was down there, you know what? I, I, we call it going on foreign soil. But you know what? You know what? It's foreign to us because it's not what we're adapted to. It's not what we're used to. It's not where we come from. So, so Joshua is about to take the, the nation of Israel. He is about to take the church into foreign soil and foreign land, even though God said, this is what I'm giving to you. But here's Joshua's problem. It's not too hard to get the people out of the wilderness, but it was getting the wilderness out of the people was going to be his difficulty. And those of you who remember that old adage from years ago, I think it came from a TV commercial, understand where that turn come from. It was, it's, for Joshua, he, he was okay to get the people out of the wilderness, but then getting the wilderness out of the people. You see, this, this Egyptian generation was dead. The wilderness generation had been birthed, but just like the, the, the Egyptian generation, they began to raise accusation against Moses and they began to say, let us go back to the flesh pots of Israel. At least we had something to eat. At least we were comfortable there even though they were in slavery. Do you realize that even in this country, and, and you know, we, 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 sometimes we think about it as being a long, 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 long time ago, but in reality, it's not really been that many years when this, 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 this country, people of this country took different ethnic groups into slavery. Do you realize even after the slaves were freed in this country that there were many slaves that chose to remain with their masters because they simply did not know any other life? Do you realize that there are people who have been incarcerated the all or maybe the majority of their life that would just soon stay incarcerated in a prison somewhere, has to go out into the world because that is the only life they've ever known? And, and, and the, these people, they, they wanted to go back to Egypt, the early generations. And this wilderness generation, they, they were probably, no doubt, they were content living in the wilderness. And they had to come to a place, they came to a realization that we're not going to have the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night anymore. 
You see, for all of that generation in the wilderness, God had shielded them in the, from the, the heat of the sun. He'd give them the cloud by day. And he'd give them a fire by night to watch out over them and to lead them and guide them. This, this, this wilderness generation has now come to a place in time in their life where there's not going to be manna that's going to fall from heaven every day of the week except for Saturday. And no more will they be able to collect manna on Friday to take them through Saturday because manna is going to cease to exist. No longer will quail be given to them. No longer will, will water come from a rock, per se. Everything is suddenly is about to change in their lives. And it was a challenge for them. It was a struggle for them because they're about to go into a new season and a new place and a new time in new ways. But yet, listen to me very carefully, but yet it was the same God that was, in, that was with the Israelites in Egypt, that was with the Israelites in the wilderness. It is the same God that would be with them as they go into the Canaan land or the land of promise that we think about. You see, God takes us through changes. He takes us through challenge, uh, through transition. But what happens is sometimes we become really challenged with going into new seasons and new days. So possessing the Canaan land three times, three times God spoke to Joshua about having courage. Possessing Canaan land, Canaan land, the the, the, the greatest thing that God had for them, possessing our Canaan land. And, and, and in a sense, in, in a biblical theological sense, we are living in Canaan land now because we have possessed the promise of God. We live in the promise of God that we sang about. But the truth of the matter is there's new seasons and there's new days and there's new times and new places. There's the same God. It's the same message. It's the same gospel. But God is taking us. He's evolving us and taking us into new seasons continually. And we tend to think of, uh, of, of the new year as being a great transition time. If you don't believe me, go home this afternoon, turn on your TV or, or pull up your computer and watch the pop-up ads. There are going to be more weight loss ads, more exercise machine ads. There's going to be more ads for, for, for doing something new and something different than you can shake a stick at. It's because they all know that we all are at the first of the year. We're making those New Year's resolutions and, and more than 70, actually it's actually of around 90% of the resolutions that we make, we will, we will not keep them. In 30 days, there'll be a thing, uh, there'll be a, just an afterthought in our mind. Most people, determinations and resolutions they make at the first of the year do not stay with them even 30 days. But we think of this new year as a new time and a new season and a new dawning and a new day. In every, most every aspect of our life. In the church the same way. But it is a good time and there will be some decisions. There will be some determinations that will be, that will be set. And, and maybe 90% won't keep their, their resolutions. But there's 10% of those resolutions that will be kept. And perhaps those 10% that are kept is what really counts. You know, as we go into a new season and a new day, everything that we set out to do, we won't accomplish. Everything, everything, every goal that we make will not be, will, will not be made. Everything that we decide that we want to do won't be done. But the reality of it is, if, if, if we can at least set those goals, if we can at least set those priorities, that we, we at least can become determined. And, and in that, we can say, we're going to do our best to accomplish what God would have us to accomplish. And even if we don't fulfill everything 100%, even if we fulfill a, just a portion of it, at least we have done something. And my mind goes to those Men that sat outside the camp, the account in scripture, they sat outside the camp and they, they were lepers and, and they knew they were dying. They were dying of leprosy. They were banished from the camp. 
And as they sat outside the camp, one day, one of them had come up with this grandiose idea of why don't we just go into the camp and see if we can get something to eat. And, and, and they begin to discuss that probably heatedly. And, and, and one guy says, man, when there's, you know, we go in there and we don't die. They don't kill us if we go into the camp. The guy, and, and, but one, this one fellow came to this, to this rationality, if you would. He said, if we sit here, we know we're going to die. If we stay here, we know we're going to die. We're going to starve to death. But if we get up and we go to the city, there's a chance that they might not kill us. There's a chance that they might give us something to eat. If we sit here, it's certain death. But if we go, there's a chance. There's a chance that we might live. And, and, and they get up and they go to the city and God works and God blesses and their lives are spared. And we, as we go into this 2018 year, there's new seasons, there's new days, there's new challenges that will be ahead of us. We're going to have to work and we're going to have to be courageous to, 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 to get the wilderness out of us. You know, because we can walk out of the wilderness, but then to get the wilderness out of us, it's going to require courage. The first, the first matter of courage is the potential, is letting our potential be transferred into power. Is letting our potential be transferred into power. You see, the Israelites had the potential to possess the land, but they had to become powered, not just empowered, but they had to become powered to possess the land. You know, there, there's people sitting in this room. There's people that are watching by, by Facebook Live right now. There's people that will be listening to the, to, to the podcast later on. There, there, there's people that are hearing the sound of my voice that you have so much potential. God has given you. God has given you giftings. God has given you talents. God has given you abilities. But until you take that potential and turn it into power, you will not really see anything accomplished. These people had the authority to go into Canaan, but until they turned it into the power to go into Canaan, they really never experienced what God had for them. And you and I can sit here and we can have all the potential in the world, but until we put the potential to work and potential becomes power, we will not see the fullness of what God wants to do. You see, there's potential here in Blue Well. There's potential for us to, to fill this church up, not just on one Sunday service, but there's enough people to reach here in Bluefield that we could fill this church up maybe two or three times on a Sunday morning service. There's potential for us to feed the hungry. There's potential for us to help the hurting. There's potential for us to do all kinds of things and ministry to people that need to be ministering to. But until we take, look at the potential and begin begin to exercise power, we will not see anything accomplished in the community which we've been assigned to. And yes, thank God that we've been able to reach other parts of the world and do it very effectively. But I still, I think, and I believe, I believe in the potential of the local church and our first and our foremost uh, uh, missions field is the, right outside of this building. And if we could reach everybody that is in need, every Everybody that is lost within one square mile of this building, this building would have to have multiple services if even then we could contain the people that we could reach. So the potential is around us. For too long, the church, the church has, you know, have any of y'all ever picked apples? Any of y'all ever picked apples or cherries? You know, what's the, what's the easiest way to pick apples? Shake the limb or you just walk up and you start picking all the apples you can reach. It, it's, it's an old business principle, been around for, for a while, but it's called the, the principle of low-hanging fruit. It's easy for, you know, you know what, and what happened, you know, what happened through the years with churches is churches, churches got used to the low hanging fruit. We could, we could get our family or, and, and what most churches, most churches in America actually thrive on transfer growth, to be honest with you. Most, not all. 
They thrive on transfer growth. You come up with the latest and greatest thing or the newest facility or whatever the case may be. And then there, what's going to happen is everybody from some, all, the, all these people from all these other facilities are going to converge on you. And all of a sudden, you know, you've experienced all this church growth. But in the truth of the matter, in, in the, in the, in the, in the statistic of reaching souls, your church has grown by a hundred or a hundred and fifty percent. But if you look at the number of souls that you've won, and the number of souls has been very minimal. Low hanging fruit. Or, 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 the, or churches, churches oftentimes through the years have found themselves, you know, people would drive for miles, people would drive for an hour, people would drive for 30 or 45 minutes to get you a church because we had that saying that a, a church that is alive is worth the drive. But you know, the truth of the matter is most of those days are past and gone. We picked all of the, you know, and once you pick all of the low-hanging fruit from the apple tree, once you pick all the apples to the bottom limb, you know what happens? You got to start climbing the tree. And as you start climbing the tree, guess what? Apple picking gets, suddenly gets a little bit harder. A apple picking requires a little bit more exertion out of us. You know? And in the world, in the world of, of America today, in the society of America today, and even right here in Blue Well, the, the, low, the apples from the low-hanging trees have been picked. The apples have been, have been pulled off of those. The, the lower limbs are bare, but there's still all kinds of apples up in the top of the tree. But we've got to take the potential and put power to it. And we've got to start working at picking the apples from the top of the tree. And Jerry, you're right. There's some, there's some, there's sometimes you can just shake the bush and the apples will fall off. But there's other times I can remember picking apples with my dad and my dad would take a 20 foot or so ladder and he would just take and throw it up beside of the tree and that ladder really wouldn't be on anything. He'd put that apple sack around my neck and he'd say, go up there and pick them apples out of the top of the tree, boy. And you get about halfway up that ladder and that ladder just takes about a three-foot ride. He says, oh, don't worry about it. It's all right. I, oh, Pop's got you. And you go up a little bit more and you go about three or more, four more feet. But you get up there to the top of that tree and at the top of that tree are some of the best apples you'll ever find. And it doesn't say that any person is better than somebody else. But what I am saying to you is this, is we have got to take our, and see the potential is around us, but our potential, we've got to utilize our power in order to reach the potential that is around us. And what we have to do, and I said this in our life group meeting this morning, underestimating ourselves is a deterrent to us. Because sometimes we sit back and we think, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I think about, and y'all read this to Reese here in, a, in, a, in, a, in another year or so, and he'll, have a, he'll, he'll comprehend this so good. It's about a little train that said, I think I can. Y'all remember that story? That little train that his, his load was so heavy. He was just a small train. And they sent him up the mountain. And, and he didn't know if he could pull the load up the mountain. And, and, and the pulling got hard. And, and, and the turnovers in those big in those pistons and that little train, it was a steam engine. It got pretty slow. But, but he kept saying, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And, and he stayed persistent to the cause. And as he stayed persistent to the cause, he eventually got to the top of the hill. He might not have been moving at the speed he was when he entered the bottom of the hill, but the important thing is he made it to the top of the hill. And when he made it over the crest of that hill, he began to say, I knew I could, I knew I could, I knew I could. You see, God is calling us to take our, our, our potential and to use it as power to reach this community. Joshua was a mere man. He was man just like you and I, but he realized his potential in God. The second thing is we have to resist the anxieties. There's not a Christian in the world who has never come under an anxiety attack. I want you to know that. If you're telling me you're a Christian and you've never had an anxiety attack, I would probably differ with you. Because we all have anxiety attacks as Christians in serving God. 
We have to resist the anxiety. You see, Joshua had to, 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 to resist anxiety. He didn't know what to do, but the important thing is Joshua didn't know who didn't know what to do. You see, anxiety to, to us as believers, anxiety to us as a church is a freezing agent. It'll freeze us up. It'll lock us up. It, it, anxiety is found in our lack of self-confidence. And a lot of times, most of our self-confidence is fueled by past failures. Somebody said, oh, pastor, we've already tried that before and it didn't work. Well, maybe the season just wasn't right. But you know, every good inventor, every good inventor of the world will tell you that they've had more failures than they have successes. In fact, the failures precede the successes. Do, did you know that, did you know that every, every world-class home run hitter, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, but Babe Ruth in particular, did you know that his, his strikeouts far exceeded his home runs? Yeah, so, so sometimes, sometimes we got to fight off the anxieties and sometimes we got to reconsider this because this failed me uh, five years ago, just because we failed in this 10 years ago, just because we failed in this last year does not mean that we're going to fail this time because we're just going to walk in obedience to God and we're not going to let our anxieties overcome us. We will not be defeated. We will not be conquered. You see... The manna in the wilderness fed the anxiety of that wilderness generation. They, they were afraid they were going to starve to death and God gave them manna and manna fed their anxiety. But when they moved from the wilderness into Canaan land, their, 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 the manna was replaced with marching. They marched into the land of Canaan and they marched into the battles and they took the land and they had to learn some lessons and some of those lessons were hard. But yet God gave them courage and they overcame every anxiety. Even the anxiety of we see ourselves as just grasshoppers in the sight of these people. God helped them overcome their anxieties. The third thing is we've got to be courageous to trust in the Holy Spirit. We must trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. You understand, and I said this again this morning in the life group, I, but, but we, we, we aren't called to be flawless experts of professional performance as Christians. We're not called to be that at all. We're not called to be perfect. We're not called to do the perfect performance. We're not called to be the perfect church. We're not called to have the perfect praise team. We're not called to have the perfect pastor. We're not called to have the, the, the perfect uh, benevolence outreach ministry. We're not called to have, have perfection in any way. We're not called to those things. We're not called to those things because if we could be perfect in those things, then understand, and I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare ourselves because I think we should, but understand this, if we were perfect in all that we do, then would we really need the Holy Spirit? But we're called to be obedient. Paul said this. He said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Understand this, God, God doesn't need us. In fact, I don't think God wants us to be perfect in all that we do. Again, I'm not saying that we should shun preparation. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't come in here and just throw my Bible open and say, well, God's going to give me something to preach. Hey, he, he tells me to study to show myself approved unto God. Uh, so, and I'm not, so I'm not saying that, but I'm saying at the same time, if we will give God everything we have, if we will in this year 2018 coming up, if we will give God every ounce of us, if we will give him everything, even if, if we will just give him more than we gave him in 2017. Listen, he doesn't, Paul, Paul was educated. Paul, if anybody had wise persuasive words, Paul would have been the guy to have it. But that's not what Paul used. But it was the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit that brought Paul to the place uh, of being the greatest apostle, the greatest evangelist that has ever walked the face of the earth in the sense of evangelism. That is what anointed the apostle Paul was the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what will anoint us in whatever we pursue in 2018. You see, our call 
when it comes down to it, our call is only to be obedient. If we will walk in obedience to God, if we will follow God, if we will follow the directionship of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, understand this, and we will give ourselves, we will study to show ourselves approved, we will prepare ourselves. If we will do that, just hold on, because God is going to do all the rest. Because what we can't do, He will do, because Paul said it's not these persuasive words of men, but it's the power and demonstration of God. If we will do what, listen, on the day of the, the, the day of Pentecost as they spilled out of the upper room, what blew the minds of, of the society gathered there that day was they heard those men speak in different languages all over the earth and they knew these were uneducated men, but yet they were fluently speaking the languages of the earth. And people saw that there was a witness that there was a demonstration of a, of a greater authority and a higher power. And it was the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And what you think you can't do and what I think I can't do and what we think that we can't do as a church if we will put our dependency in God and walk in obedience to him, he will anoint us in so doing. I read this story. I read this story and I thought it interesting. That's how I, I, I claimed that the story, the, the thought of the story is the title for this message. Only if my father's holding the rope. And it was, it was a story in, uh, uh, that came from, uh, I believe it was in Switzerland actually. But it was an account of a diff difficult rescue that took place at the top of a very steep and a very dangerous cliff. An individual was believed to have fallen off of that cliff, but the way the cliff was made, and this, this was the perfect picture. I think it was a God moment. Because of the angle of the cliff, it, re it recessed as it went down. They stood on top of the cliff and they knew some, th that, that this other individual had fallen, but they couldn't see them. And they needed to send somebody down over the side of the cliff to see if they could spot the fallen individual. And as they looked around, they, they knew it was going to be difficult because you're, 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 you're trying to, to support the weight of a, of a person as it goes over the side of that cliff. Would, it would be suddenly become very heavy. The rope could break or you could lose an, another man over the side of the cliff. So they, they began to look for somebody that was small in stature. And they saw this young boy. This young boy was a was by, by reputation, he was a shepherd and he was used to rough terrain. He was used to climbing and scaling cliffs and rocks and mountainsides. They asked this young boy, they said, will you let us harness you up and drop you off the side of the cliff? And he hesitated at first. And he said, no. He said, I don't really think I'm up to this. I, I really, there's, there's too much fear in me to allow you to do this. And they kept beckoning and they kept asking this boy, well, please, you're our only hope to, to see if you can find the one that is lost. And suddenly the boy begins to look and he, he sees his dad coming down the road. And this boy said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll let you lower me over the cliff. And I will go and I will find that one that is lost. He said, but the only way that I will agree to do this is you let my father hold the rope. If my daddy's holding the rope, I'll do it. Because if my daddy's holding the rope, I'm going to be all right. And you see, everything that God's given us to do as, as, as individuals and of course as a church, everything that he's given us to do, if we will just allow God to lower us down over the cliff, allow him to hold the rope in our life and let him take us into what he wants us to take into take us into and to trust him 
then we'll see the fruition of what God's wanting to bring us to. I just want you to bow your heads with me just a moment. This morning has not necessarily been an evangelistic type of message. I realize that. But there may be somebody that has needs in their life. There may be somebody that's maybe you've never been saved. Maybe, maybe, you've, maybe you've fallen far away from God and you need to renew your relationship with Him. But if you're in this room and, and, and that's you, you need to renew yourself. You need to rededicate your life. Or maybe you've never been saved. And as you go into this new year, you want to go into this new year knowing that you're saved. That your name has been written in that Lamb's book of life. If that's you, would you just simply raise your hand real quickly in this place this morning? I take from that response that everybody in this place is, is ready to meet the Lord. And that's good. And perhaps you're at home and watching this or... You're driving, maybe driving in your car or watching it as you drive. And um, we urge you to be careful, of course, if you're doing that. But today is a day that you can know God. You can call on Him, ask Him to forgive you of your sins, and believe in Him to be Jesus, born of a virgin, falsely accused, falsely crucified, buried but rose again on the third day. And if you can believe that and confess your faults, your sins to Him, then He's your Lord and He's your Savior and you'll be saved. But this is what I want to do. We're going to say goodbye to our Facebook audience. Merry, or Merry Christmas has passed by Happy New Year Facebook audience.